Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to be able to be together to worship. Uh, one of the things we're also going to be doing this morning is taking communion. Uh, so if you don't have any elements available, maybe now is the time to go grab them as we're going to do that later this morning. In Psalms 13, it says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. We get to do that this morning. We get to join our voices together as one church calling upon the name of the Lord our God. So let's do that this morning.
excited to lift up that name, the name of Jesus this morning. I think it's really obvious, especially to those of us that are Christians, as we look around to see that the world is not the way that it's supposed to be. I think what gives us hope in that in those times when we see it so obviously is the ability to call on the name of the Lord who's worthy to be praised, to remind ourselves and each other what we believe and the hope that's found in the resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to continue to sing that this morning to remind ourselves what is true. Yeah. 
today, we just proclaim our belief in you. Lord God, we proclaim that we believe in your crucifixion. We believe that you conquered death. We believe in your resurrection. And we believe that you are coming back again. So Father, even in these days of desperation, we believe, Lord God, in these days where there are doubts and there are fears, we proclaim and we believe. Lord, in these days where there's a broken generation, we believe. And Lord, in these days when all seems dark, We believe. So, Father, this morning, I just pray that you would just let love invade. Lord, as we sang, may love just invade our lives, our speech, our hearts, Lord God. And may we, as a church, as the church with a capital C, as church with LEFC, Lord, may we as a church live loud and proclaim that we believe in you. May it be evident by what we say and by what we do. Lord, I just pray a blessing upon our time today. For God, we just are so grateful that we get to come together and proclaim what we believe. We pray this in your precious name. have several high school students uh, who are a part of our church who are graduating uh, this month. Now, as you can guess, it's probably a really weird time to be graduating from high school. So our youth pastors have put together a little video uh, just to acknowledge and appreciate those who are graduating this season. Hey, LEFC. I'm Jeff. I'm one of the youth pastors here. And my name is Tyler, and I'm another youth pastor here at LEFC. I'm Rihanna, and I am the Student Ministries intern. So class of 2020, we just wanted to make something special for you today. We know that you've missed out on a lot this season, including in-person graduation. So had you been able to have graduation at your school, here are nine things that you definitely would have experienced. And our next graduate is Chassie Yaberfalo. Um, Chase Yarborough, Chassie Yaberfalo. <laughs> and our next graduate is Jeff Travis. Our next graduate is Brianna Beers. Our next graduate is Chassi Yaberfalo. Well, class of 2020, I am so honored to be your commencement speaker this year. Before I get to my charge to you, I'd like to just thank a few people. First of all, I'd love to thank Pastor Tony for going out of his way to shepherd me in my spiritual journey. I'd like to thank my second cousin's niece. You have made such a large impact on my life. And finally, for the person who walks my cat so faithfully, you don't know truly what you have done for me. So long ago, back in my day, when I was sitting in your seat, the world was a different place. Well, graduates, now that you're about to enter the real world, 
Just remember, in the real world, you have to pay taxes. In the real world, you have to get a job and go every single day in the real world. And in the real world, you have to pick up your children from school every day in the real world. And class of 2020, as my last charge to you, get out there and grab the bull by the horns. Well, class of 2020, we just wanted to say congratulations from us at LEFC to you. Whether you're graduating from high school, college, uh, grad school, a different cert certification program, whatever it may be, congratulations on a job well done. Keep pressing forward into whatever the next phase of life that God is calling you into. Run after him, keep him number one in your life. We're so glad that you're part of our family here at LEFC. We're gonna continue to pray for you and spur you on as best that we can. So again, congratulations from us, we're proud of you and grab the bull by the horns. Well, that was fun. <laughs> you know, even though we're separated right now into various homes and we're not gathering all as one church, we can still have community. And we've been doing our best to create that community along the way and today, we wanted to make sure it and have inclusion for those who are graduating and going into the next chapter of their lives. As part of community, what we typically do together is a thing called communion. It's meant to be practiced together where the church takes a moment to be able to remember what Jesus Christ has done for all of us that's made us a family. There was a reason why Jesus chose to do this, is he knew that as time went on and generation to generation would go on, there needed to be a means by which a common practice of the gathering of those who are called the family of God under the name of Jesus Christ, that they could practice something together that would make sure that they would not forget that which made them a family. And so part of that journey is in and of itself the practice of, of communion, to remember the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and these elements are to draw our memory to that. And so in this time, we will take together, I will give you an opportunity to consider that which Christ has done for you. You know, it says that when we take of the bread, we're to remember him for his body and the way he lived. And then when we take of the cup, we're to remember that the blood that poured out of his body that day is what covers the multitude of sin, past, present, future. And so as part of our memory, we will take some time now to just recall all that Christ has done for us. And then we will take of the elements together. So would you join me now in a, in a moment of silence and prayer and meditation to recall all that Jesus has done for us.
Jesus, the name that is above all names, whom the Father said, I will put all things under his feet, that at that very name, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that indeed Jesus is Lord. So as we partake of these elements together, Father, may you have a smile on your face, acknowledging that we understand the gospel, that we understand that this was an act of grace. We didn't deserve this. But that because of your love, we now have the opportunity to come before you without fear or shame, but in the confidence of Jesus' name. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, they had had a meal together. And then some point in the meal, he broke some bread, passed it to everyone around the table, and, and he said, this is my body which is for you. So in your homes right now, would you partake with us the bread and remember all that Christ has done in his body, choosing a moment to recollect. And at some point later in the evening, we don't know the expanse of time, but Jesus took a cup that had the fruit of the vine in it. And he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. This blood will be shed for you, a once and for all sacrifice. No longer will the blood of animals, a temporal sacrifice, be needed because he who came and had no sin became sin for us when he died upon that cross. He paid the penalty. Those disciples had no idea all that was going to be accomplished just hours after this moment. But we now get to participate in that table, drinking of this cup, knowing exactly what was going to happen. So let's take together of the cup, remembering that that blood is sufficient. Thank you, Jesus. It is enough what you accomplished 2,000 years ago. It is enough that we can stand here now without shame, knowing that we're seen as white as snow by the Father because we have entered through the curtain that is your body. And now we stand redeemed. So we honor you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. we reflect on that truth, the gospel, what God has done for us, I think back to the words that we've prayed and sang already this morning, let the church live loud. In this broken generation, as we look around and we see so many of the trials, so many of the things plaguing our world right now, let the church live loud. And not because of us, not because of our opinions that are so great that we have all the answers to everything yet not I 
but through Christ in us. So that leads us into the next song that we're going to sing, asking that God would shine to the world through us in spite of us. Because we're unqualified for it by ourselves. But Christ alone leads us to it. As we do that, you'll have the opportunity to give just as we've worshiped through singing, praying, and through taking communion. Uh, Now we can worship through singing and giving as well. And you can see on the screen the ways that you can be giving during this time. Thank you. 
is such a humbling truth that your creation that you created in your image fell from you, chose to walk away. And yet you chose out of your great love to come down in our midst, to die on our behalf and to raise to life again, to give us hope. And then to continue to redeem us even as we struggle against the powers of darkness in this world. Lord, continue to renew our minds and remind us of the truth of what you came to do on our behalf and let it guide us to love others just as you loved us, that you laid down your life for us. Lord, let that truth define us and motivate us, Lord. Lord, I pray for Tony as he comes to speak today. Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear and our minds to understand the truth of your word, the truth of your gospel. And Lord, that we would be able to discern what is truly your truth and not be swept away by the lies that this world will try to use to sway us. Lord, I pray that we will hear the message and apply it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. So I have some good news. Uh, we will begin worshiping on site next Sunday here on June 14th. And so if you have been anticipating that day and you're looking forward to it, it is coming. And so that gives you three options for next week to be able to uh, worship. You can continue to stay at home if you're a high-risk person you uh, are not feeling well, uh, please stay home. Enjoy the live stream. We will continue to do so. The live streams will be at 9 and 1050, our normal service time. So you'll have a couple of different options for live streaming for next week. And additionally, uh, you could, if you would like, to gather uh, at somebody's home or barn, as I understand some have done, uh, you can certainly continue to do that and watch it via live stream together with a smaller group if you'd prefer during this season to do so. Or if you want to come on site, uh, you have that opportunity again starting next week. And that on site will look a little differently depending on which service. We want to be able to provide, at least initially, the opportunity for those who are of higher risk, uh, have a lot more reason to be cautious, uh, to be able to still come on site uh, to our services. And so at 9 o'clock, it'll be a mask-required service. We do have our seating will be spaced out, so uh, we will practice social distancing. And uh, it will also be a touchless service, if you will. Second service will be a mask-elective service. So while we would still encourage masks, it is your choice. There is no shaming as to what you decide, but it will be a service where people get to make that decision for themselves. We'll still practice social distancing, and it will still be a uh, basically a service of care and concern, but opportunity to still be together, and it'll be touchless as a result. Now, we will serve coffee on site. Some of you are like, well, I'm not coming unless they serve coffee. Just, again, good news. We're going to do that, but we're going to serve it to you. So there'll be some information coming this week on what it, uh, to be able to sign up for a service because our capacity is going to go from, you know, quite a few seats to much less, uh, below 50% capacity. And so that does mean that uh, we need to do a sign up to make sure we don't overload one of those two services. So the opportunity to sign up will be on our website and that will begin uh, Wednesday evening. And so you can look for that opportunity at that time. 
and we will have overflow opportunities here on site if we run out of space for the maskless time because according to a survey, that's where the majority of you will come. And so we'll have video venues as, as we provided as we run out of space. So again, it'll be great to have people in the room and to be able to uh, once again begin to worship together and fellowship together here on site at LEFC. But we understand it may be a while for some of you to be able to come and until then, we will, again, uh, we'll be able to provide as much as we can, not just the services online, which will continue here forward. We'll continue to live stream, but we'll try to, try to provide other resources along the way as we go through the season of reentry into what is a new normal, at least until there is a vaccine. That right there is a strange statement, is it not, to say, until there is a vaccine, there is a new normal. We have been in an uncertain period of time, quite frankly, over the last three months where we've had to behave differently. Uh, we've had to wear masks out in public, and depending on what phase as to whether it was elective or required, and, and then as a result, you got different, uh, different responses based on whether you wore a mask or not, you saw a little bit of mass shaming as somebody walked into the grocery store without one and so on, and then it became required, and, uh, and then you started seeing people starting to police each other, and it created an interesting dynamic out in society. It wasn't the most pleasant, for sure. As I walked about, it was also very difficult to recognize somebody's emotions or to tell if they were approachable or not, and possibly even standing right next to somebody I know and not even realize who it is because the mask covers over that person's features. And so I get the season that we've been in has not been desirable for any of us. But it's also over the last few days taken on a new sense of energy as we have seen the, the protests, in some cases riots, and, uh, and it's revealed other issues in our society that create pain. And again, has invited a lot of different messengers into the arena as to what should be our response. All of this, quite frankly, whether it be the pandemic or the racial tensions that divide America, there is a question that rises up that is natural to ask. What is the truth? What is the truth of the pandemic? How serious is it? What should we do? What would be the responsible thing to do? But what is the truth? In the racial tensions, what is the truth? It's hard to find out sometimes, unless you've seen for evidence. For those that are serving in hospitals, they know the truth of the pandemic. For those who've lived in very diverse areas, they know the truth of the racial tensions. But if you have not been at let's say, around some of the realities that maybe medical professionals or those who live in more urban settings. If you are not there, where can you find the truth? So if you're looking for the truth, where can you go find it to know that you're receiving good information? And then who can you trust to give you that truth? In light of the, the misinformation that I have seen out there over the last several weeks, regarding the pandemic, and then, yes, misinformation over the last two weeks in regards to some of the racial tension, it is difficult to wade through the waters and figure out where is the truth, what is the truth, and who can I trust to give it to me. What I can tell you confidently, it's not wise to rely upon social media. It's a source of varying degrees of truth which then means truth is hard to discern. Just like our times, Peter is writing his letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, and in particular 2nd Peter, in uncertain times. If you felt it was uncertain times over the last three months, imagine being a part of the church in Peter's lifetime when they were hearing rumors of what Romans were doing to Christians. What possible Jewish leaders who were anti-Jesus being the Messiah, what they were hearing was being done by some synagogue leaders. 
There was a lot of rumors on the street, and it was very difficult to discern what was true. There were a lot of messengers giving warnings. There were a lot of people saying, this is what you should do. In the end of the day, Peter became concerned for how the gospel would be co-opted in the midst of such uncertain times. He knew people were easily led astray. He knew they were susceptible to these various messengers. That's why in his letter, 2 Peter, he, said, he puts an emphasis on grace and truth. Because grace is at the core of the message of the gospel. The work of Jesus Christ was done by the initiation of the loving heart of God. He was the one that determined that, that Jesus needed to go and die for mankind. It was God who initiated it all. And man has nothing to do with their own salvation. It is a work of God, therefore grace. And the truth of the sufficiency of the blood of Christ, again, was under argument. And so that's why Peter kept speaking to its grace. It's a work of God. And the truth is, it was enough what Jesus did. He is indeed the Lord and Savior, the Messiah. So in the letter, you will discover grace and truth riddled throughout. But you will also see warnings and descriptions concerning false teachers. So next week, we'll look at what he says concerning false teachers, specifically in 2 Peter 2. But today, we're going to look at the truth. We're going to look at the truth. What is the truth of the message that he speaks to? If it is grace and truth that is so important to discern whether somebody is teaching correctly or incorrectly, then we need to go back to the very foundation of what the message of Jesus Christ actually is. And we are going to utilize Peter's very first message of the gospel. That message happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Pentecost was the celebration of the 50th day post the Passover. These 50 days were known as the Feast of Weeks, and have been practiced for generations by the Hebrew people. It is the turning of a chapter, that 50th day. See, after enjoying the fruit of the harvest, the 50th day begins a new chapter. It's a new start. So on this day, a new start has begun. A new chapter has begun for the church. You see, Jesus had said, when he was ascending into heaven, he told the apostles, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. So they waited, and they were in Jerusalem waiting for the Spirit to come. Jesus said that Spirit will lead you into all truth. He will be the one that will give you power and authority to speak this gospel, this message of good news to other people, and in particular to all peoples of the world making disciples of them, followers of Jesus, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So while they did not know how this would work, they knew about the Holy Spirit, but they had not known the Holy Spirit to be something among men. They had only observed in the text of the past when the Holy Spirit would show up. They had only seen the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, but to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, they themselves had never known that. So it is not by mistake or circumstance that just somehow the Holy Spirit shows up on the 50th day. It is part of God's plan that on the 50th day, a new chapter begins in the life of the church. It is the day when the gospel message is now put through the mouths of men to be received in the hearts of people. It's a fascinating moment that we're about to read, and it's in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that we will be going to today. 
Acts chapter 2. And while you're turning there, let me just kind of set the scene for a moment before we get to the message of Peter. They had been waiting on the Holy Spirit. But while they're waiting on the Holy Spirit, the celebration and the coming of the end of the Feast of the Weeks and the anticipation of Pentecost, the new chapter, brings a lot of people into the city of Jerusalem. They're coming to celebrate this Pentecost. What they didn't realize was that Pentecost was going to receive a new meaning, a new chapter that they had not anticipated. And so all these well-meaning, God-fearing Jews have entered into the city thinking they're going to celebrate as they always have a traditional Pentecost. But then something happens, a sound and a visual that causes them to stop in their tracks and be drawn to a particular house where they see and hear people that they clearly can tell are from the region of Galilee, men and women both speaking in tongues that were not their own, speaking in the languages of the people. See, the Jewish worshipers were coming from all over the Roman Empire, and they knew languages that were from the regions they had come from. And now they're hearing their own languages being spoken of by all these Galileans. And so, of course, it drew them there. And then it says that they saw what looked like fire falling on each of them. So they're being mesmerized by this moment of people that shouldn't know this language speaking it, but then seeing something like that of fire falling upon all of them. It was perplexing. They didn't know how to interpret it. Well, as this moment is kind of coming to a conclusion, Peter, filled with that power of the Holy Spirit, and now empowered by that Spirit to speak truth so the truth could be understood, begins to speak to the crowd that had begun to gather. Now, what we know in the text is that in verse 13, some of the people immediately began to think, they must be drunk. They must be drunk. And so Peter begins there, understanding the context of the confusion that was there and the beginning of mockery to be able to speak this message. So he begins there, verse 14. So then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter starts at the surface. He acknowledges that this seems strange to all of those who are witnessing what had just happened to those in that upper room. I mean, who would have thought that they could have spoken languages they had never learned? Who would have thought that there would be some kind of visual representation of the coming of the Holy Spirit that looks like the same description that they have in the written text of the Shekinah glory coming upon the temple of God? So they witnessed something that they had read about, that Shekinah glory, now not coming upon a single facility, a building called the temple, but now coming upon people. Now, it's very easy that if you experience something that seems otherworldly, and your mind is having a hard time believing it, that you want to somehow dismiss what you just saw. Give no thought to it. You don't want to try to figure it out. So the weak in mind or the fearful at heart would be very quick to dismiss it without thought. So what would you do? 
How can you somehow dismiss what everybody just saw and what everybody just heard? Oh, natural. They must have been drinking. They must have been drunk. The challenge is, true in even our culture today, very few people are drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. Now, hangovers, maybe. But drunk, not so much. So Peter addresses it, and you kind of get a sense that, that he's kind of chuckling a little bit, knowing what was being said in the room. <laughs> We're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. That would have happened last night. So he addresses the immediate dismissals and mockery that can come in that moment. But what he does do that he knows will keep them listening, he appeals to history. And in particular, he appeals to the history, the historical prophetic statement of Joel. Now they're listening. Because as soon as a prophet or scripture of old is read, the Jew would immediately, out of respect, listen. So Peter begins to quote the prophet Joel. And he begins by speaking with this validation, again, of the Old Testament, the the written scriptures that the Hebrews would know, that, that with that validation, he begins to speak of what Joel describes that now is coming to fruition before their very eyes. Let's look at what the descriptions were. It says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. It would be inarguable for those who were of Jewish descent and had studied the Jewish text to to dismiss such a statement because they had received this as scripture. So, yes, there will be a day when the Spirit of God will be poured out on all people. Huh. I never considered what that might actually look like. The Spirit of God with Shekinah glory coming on a temple What would the Spirit of God coming upon people actually look like? Would it look like that Shekinah glory? Huh, maybe that's so. And then it describes what that prophecy will look like, that young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my Spirit in those days on both servants and and then men and women. So in other words, all classes of society will receive this. It's not just a priestly order. It will be slave, it will be free, it will be men, it will be women. This, again, was written in the old. They knew it, they had studied it, and now they're seeing these men and women who had received the Holy Spirit were doing things that they had never been trained to do, nor educated to do. It had to be supernatural. It had to be of the Spirit of God. Then continuing on, it says that in verse 20 or 19, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Some of them probably were drawn back to 50 days earlier when there were some amazing things that happened. When Jesus was hanging on the cross. Read that text and then go back and read in any part of the gospels that describe the crucifixion of Jesus. And try to capture what maybe those in this audience this day must have been thinking. Oh my goodness. We've seen these very things. We've seen those very things 50 days before, and now we're seeing the Spirit of God. Could it be true that the Spirit of God is being poured out on these days? And then the final statement out of Joel is, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, the description of these last days is Actually, one of horror when when things will when the when the sun will be darkened and this blood and billows of smoke. It's not speaking of a pretty picture. It calls that you need the help of God. You need to call upon Him to be saved from the storm. So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now the question is, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that you call upon to be saved? This is an important question to be answered. 
Because again, keep in mind where I began on this sermon is that what is the truth? Where can I find it? And who can I trust to speak it? So now Peter is speaking the truth that was revealed in the prophet Joel and now connecting the dots to what had happened in their lifetime and now we can receive for today. But the question you must answer, who is the Lord that we call upon to be saved? Verse 22, Peter continues speaking to them. After now, quoting Joel, he now explains. Fellow Israelites, Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made my paths, made known to me the paths of life. And you will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is still here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father what was promised through the Holy Spirit and was poured out on what you see and hear now. Let me stop there. The question is, who is Lord? Who's the one you call upon to be saved? In this text, he makes the case that Jesus the one who was crucified before their very eyes, the one that they had seen also all the wonders and signs of, was indeed that Lord. Now, Jesus went around Israel from the north to the south, doing signs and wonders as a means for God to validate that this is somebody that you should listen to. His authority, his authority and power became so evident that you had to determine that certainly his power was supernatural. But the question became, depending on your heart, was that authority and power coming from Beelzebub, Satan himself, or was he coming from God, God himself, Yahweh? But the authority and power continued along with a spirit that undoubtedly was filled with compassion and love and unity which could not possibly be from the spirit of Beelzebub, Satan himself. So this display that Christ was doing that was supernatural was a means of how God was saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. In the same way that voice said that when Jesus came out of the water at his baptism, so also he said it again on that mount of transfiguration before Peter. Peter got to see this and hear this. Many moments, God showed his approval of Jesus. Then it was also needed to be said because many people were like, well, he wasn't very powerful because he died at the hands of men. But Peter takes that on as well and says, listen, yes, wicked men killed him, but this was part of God's deliberate plan. God's deliberate plan to make him the lamb of life. So he was going to die according to the plans of God. And yes, wicked men fell trap, if you will, to the very deliberate plans of God. So you have here a revealed power in Jesus that you have to ascribe as coming from God. And then you have to understand that, that this 
death could not have happened if it wasn't for the will of God. And then lastly, he speaks in verses 24 to 27 that the resurrection of Jesus was also part of God's sovereign plan. So not only is Jesus the Lord by which all men can call upon and be saved, but Jesus is the risen Lord who now operates with power and authority at the right hand of God. So Peter testifies that he is indeed a witness to the resurrected Messiah, that, Jesus, that God is, has raised this Jesus to life, and that he is witness, verse 32, that he is witness of this very fact. So he's standing publicly and testifying, I am on record for seeing the resurrected Lord. And then saying, that same Lord has now gone to the Father so that he can become our high priest and advocate. Verse 33. And then verse 36. The the Jew always knew that the Messiah was going to come. They were hoping for him. They wanted that leader that would rescue the Jewish people from the hands of the Romans. That was their prayers. What they underestimated was that Jesus was going to come as Messiah, and rescue not only the Jew, but the Gentile as well. So what does this mean for you and me? What does this mean for you and me? If Jesus is truly the Lord by which one can call upon and be saved, and he is the one that God affirmed before the eyes of mankind. He is the one I've given power and authority to. It's his name by which people will become saved. And he is indeed a resurrected Lord. What should the audience that is hearing Peter's message do? What should they feel? Keep in mind, many of them began with mockery when they saw this this power of the Holy Spirit coming upon people from Galilee, both men and women. Let's begin reading the response of the people in verse 37. When people heard what Peter had said, they were cut to the heart. Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom our Lord God will call. With many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message then that day were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the very number of the church that day. They were cut to the heart. You see, for those of you that are watching online right now or listening by radio, as you hear these things, you're either in your heart dismissing them or in your heart resonating with the words being true. And for some of you, perhaps for the first time, this message cut to your heart. It pricked your heart. And you realize for the first time, Jesus is Lord. And he's a resurrected Lord. And he's the one by which you can call upon and be saved. You see, that day, many went into the city thinking it was all about Pentecost, a new chapter. Thinking that it was just entering a new season of planting seeds into the soil so that someday another crop will rise up and then that crop will be harvested in a, and then the fruit will be partaken of once again in the Feast of Weeks. Not realizing that now a new harvest is being prepared for and it's the souls of mankind. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And if your heart is not cut by that reality, you stand before God with no hope. You see, there's only one name by which anyone could be saved, and that is Jesus himself. 
Peter spoke as a witness to these facts. And it was shared with us all these years later. For all those who are far off that God will call, we stand with hope before God. It's been my prayer that your heart will be cut to the core and realize maybe for the first time this Jesus who you've heard about. That yes, you may have heard the story that he died on a cross. Yes, you may have heard the story that he rose again, but never connected the dots that all that was for you. All that was for you so that you could have hope that when your final breath happens on this earth and you stand before God, knowing that God expects absolute perfection towards him, and you realize you're not perfect. You have nothing to offer God. And God understood that from the beginning, which is why he sent his son Jesus to die for you, to provide a way where those of us who are in error could have hope by trusting in the work of Jesus Christ. He is the risen Lord. He is the one that God sent, known as the Messiah. He is the one by which all of us will have to give an account. So you today, just like Peter, gives an invitation. So you today need to repent. That term that Peter uses here is a meaning of to stop going in the direction you're going and go a new one. Or literally to change one's mind and purpose for life. You see, repentance is realizing in your mind who you are before God as imperfect. So then the declaration that Jesus is perfect and he's the Lord and you'll trust in his work on your behalf and seek the forgiveness of your sins by looking to the one whose sacrifice covers over those sins. But then Peter also says, and be baptized. Be baptized. We practice baptism today. Baptism is an opportunity to declare that which God has done in our lives. Baptism doesn't save us. It's merely an opportunity for us to say, do not know me as what I used to be, but now know me as somebody that Jesus has saved. And now I live for him as my Lord. At the point of making that commitment before Jesus, Peter mentions that you too then will receive the Holy Spirit. Not only those who believed in his lifetime, but it says for those who are far off, and we are very far off, we're 2,000 years later, that we're part of the ones that can receive this Holy Spirit once we have believed and confessed our sins and repented and chosen to follow after Jesus as our Lord. So now you have an invitation that I give to you. Based on what Peter said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Lord and awesome Savior for all of mankind? Do you understand that you have fallen short of what God wants? Sin abounds in all of us, but yet God has provided a way, an act of grace by which our sins can be forgiven. Which then gives our opportunity to understand that. Because of that understanding, we realize we're going to repent and now make Jesus Lord of our life, not us lording and leading over our own lives. We'll go a new way. And then, as Jesus asked and as Peter asked, be baptized. Let others know that what Jesus has done so that others' hearts can be pricked like my heart was pricked all those years ago. And as I've been praying that yours will be pricked today. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I do not know who's been watching or who has been listening to this message, but you do. And your Holy Spirit can go to the heart of every person both men and women, young or old, regardless of class.
God, by your Holy Spirit, would you cut them to the heart and let them see for the first time the truth as to who is really Lord. And the truth as to what account we'll all have to give. And the truth that God has already provided the way we merely have to receive and believe. God, would you do that work in the hearts of all those who have heard and listened to this broadcast? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So if you have the opportunity to take some time to discuss with those that you're sitting among right now, or if you're by yourself, to consider these questions. If and when did you give your life to Jesus? For those of you that have done that before, what caused you to make that decision? What cut you to the heart that made you decide, he is going to be my Lord. I'm going to follow after him. Or perhaps I need to ask you the question, what has kept you from making that decision? Why will you not declare him as Lord of your life? Will you accept that invitation right now? Next question, how do you see the work of the Holy Spirit in your life today? For those of us that have given our lives to Jesus, it says that Holy Spirit is given to us at the point of decision. How do you see his work in your life today? Do you feel his conviction? Do you feel his guidance of your life? Let's acknowledge it and lean in and let him continue to lead each and every day. How would you then explain the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to someone else? How can you explain to somebody like Peter? He's talking to a group of people who did not have the Holy Spirit and we're looking at him like, you're drunk. How can you have that conversation with somebody that looks at your life and say, I don't get it? Lastly, if you have been baptized, what effect did it have on you? Share that with those you're sitting with right now. It's a special moment to declare who is Lord of your life for others to hear. And if Jesus is indeed Lord of your life and you've never been baptized, why not? Why are you withholding? Just so you know, we have a brand new baptistry that is waiting for you. In fact, today will be the first baptism. In it. And it's a beautiful story. Because I know the story from beginning to end on this one. And I'm excited to be able to show that baptism to you next, next week. We're called to do this so that others will know. It's part of following Jesus as an example. Jesus did it. Peter did it. The early church did it. We follow 2,000 years later. It's a means of proclamation. And when Jesus gets a hold of your life, why would you withhold that testimony? It's been a pleasure going back to the foundation of truth with you all today the gospel. And next week, we'll talk about what it means to seek after the truth and where to find that truth and who to learn it from. May God bless you this day. May God bless your time and conversation. And I look forward to seeing many of you very, very soon.